I'm Steph Hansen, faculty at Iowa State University. And I'm Mary Janowski, faculty at the University of Nebraska. When we started our faculty positions, we quickly realized how important mentoring can be to the success of our graduate students and our programs. Using the principles of community, communication, and curiosity, we'll give you actionable tips to become a better graduate student mentor based on what we've learned during our mentoring journey. We've We've made the mistakes. mistakes. So you don't have to, because mentoring matters. Hello, mentors, and welcome to the Mentoring Matters podcast. We thought we'd start out today with giving little updates about what's been going on with our teams. So Mary, what's been going on with your mentees? Well, we recently had the Midwest Animal Science meetings, and I had a few of my students give presentations. And how did you help them get set up for success with those presentations? When I first started with this cohort, we actually did a lot of discussion about giving presentations, and I actually worked with them to develop some presentations, helping them learn about effective communication, whether that be you know scientific presentations or extension, which of course is something I'm really interested in. Effective communication is really about meeting the audience where they're at. And I was really impressed with my students, how they use those concepts and brought them into their presentations on their science. They kept coming back to things that the audience should already know, and they kept bringing them back as they were talking throughout the presentation. Yeah, so our meetings this year were entirely virtual, and so the students have gotten really good at making really nice voiceover PowerPoints. But the way that I set it up with my group is I really like to do a nice set of deadlines. So about a month before whatever meeting we're going to, they get email from me, or we talk about it in our group grad meeting with a series of deadlines. And those deadlines pretty much look like the first week of that four-week lag time is to get an outline on their PowerPoint put together so we can sit down in our meeting and talk about what discussion points they want to bring in, maybe which data they want to show, which ones they don't have room for, how they're going to craft their story, because that's such an important piece of effective communication, like you mentioned, with your students having that story. If they're really experienced students, I don't make them do an outline. It's really more for the newbies to get their, th- their thoughts organized. Then the next step is to send a first draft of the PowerPoint. And then a lot of times we'll meet one-on-one and just walk through that PowerPoint slide by slide and really just get a handle on what their story is what they want to talk about on each slide. And then the third week is um, kind of final drafts, edits, and they're supposed to practice with their peers before they practice with me. And this time we actually did a group Zoom meeting to have six of them practice and basically ran it like a little virtual session. And then everybody from the group gave feedback to each other. And so it was really good because there was a lot of positive feedback, but good constructive criticism as well. And overall, I was really pleased with their final product. They just made some really professional and polished looking presentations. Yeah, that, that's interesting because you made the comment about uh, them sending you the PowerPoint ahead of time. So I usually just have them run through it with me in a meeting as kind of the initial starting point of, okay, what's what's the main things you want to talk about here? What's going on? And then they go back and polish it. And then we do the same thing with the group meeting where everybody kind of gives uh, basically a mini session where everybody gives their presentations and get feedback from other professors as well as uh, from their fellow students. And I think that's really, really helpful for them. Yeah, I think anything you can do to help those new students build confidence, um, they're always kind of scared to death before they go to their first conference and things like that. So giving them the practice opportunity is really great. And I think this is something we'll bring up um, in a future episode to kind of talk about in detail what our process is, because we've developed that over a lot of years. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay, Steph. So the question of the week is, how do you tell your students uh, what your expectations are? Yeah, I think this is one of the things that took me a little while to warm up to. Not that I'm not a big fan of it, but I just didn't realize that it was something that I, I really needed to be doing. I came from a graduate program where I felt like I had tremendous mentorship, but it was a very informal mentor program. And that worked really well for my advisor And it wasn't going to work as well for me. I was very busy. I was traveling a lot. I had a lot of students with varying levels of experience. I didn't have a lab tech the way that my advisor had. I needed more structure in there. So the way that I try to communicate expectations to my graduate students is right from the get-go when we have basically the interview. 
So during the interview, I will lay out very bluntly, because anybody who knows me knows I'm a very honest person. I don't have much of a filter, (laughs) which is not always great. But I will lay that out for the student during the interview and basically say, you know, these are the hours that you're expected to be in the office. These are the expectations that you have as part of your research assistantship or your teaching assistantship. And then I also have them meet with my graduate students during that interview process and I'll buy them all lunch and I'm not there for that meeting. And the grad students know that it's their job to make sure that this person interviewing really understands exactly what the level of expectation of our group is. And I will always go talk to those grad students after the interview is over and say, well, what did you think? It's really good to get that that buy-in from the group. And it's great for the person interviewing to get a sense from all different levels of the program of what the program expects. So how about you? I really agree with a lot of the things you brought up. Also, helping those students make that change from undergraduate to graduate school, particularly for master's students, which is a lot of the students that I take on. As we mentioned in the previous podcast, those students really have kind of a hard time making that transition to the less structured, more self-driven type of a program. Right off the bat, as you mentioned in the interview, I actually have a mutual expectations document. It's not really long, and it's definitely, I would not say, fully comprehensive, but it gives them a good understanding of what graduate school is going to be like in terms of what I expect, as well as what they should expect from me. And I think that's just as important to help them realize right up front that we are more of a guide and we are there to help them with their program but truly they are the captain of of their own ship, helping them see that they're not just going to be another student in a classroom, that really the classroom is kind of the classroom of life now and everything in terms of learning is going to come from more than just the classroom. In fact, classrooms are a very, very small part of what they're going to do. I think it's really, really important. So I think clear communication is absolutely essential to the success of what we're talking about here today, you know, articulating those expectations at the start of their program, it just gives them all of the groundwork and builds that foundation to get them off to a successful start. One of the things that I struggled with early on was I knew what I wanted them to do. Like, why weren't they just reading my mind and understanding (laughs) what I wanted them to do, right? Like, just do your dang job. You know, like you said, the new ones, they have no idea what their job is. Like, they don't know what they've just signed up for, especially if they didn't do undergraduate research or have some kind of research experience or mentoring experience that helped them see what grad school was even going to be like. So I think this idea of saying, okay, here's very explicitly the vacation that you get based on your appointment, the expectations for when you should be in the office. Some people might think that that's kind of rigid, but if I tell my students, I expect you to be available to me if I want to come down and have a conversation, that's a two-way street. I'm also showing that I will also be available to them. Thinking about office hours, I also lay out that I'd like them to be in the office for most of the day, from 8 to 5. However, I also have kind of a caveat in there that, for instance, if if you're working on writing and you work best in a coffee shop, that, okay, you cannot be there during that time. But the reason why I want you to, to try to make it a regular thing to be in the office during normal times, not in COVID times, of course, is so that they can get those experiences that aren't in the classroom. A lot of learning comes from talking to your colleagues, both those interactions in the hallway, those interactions in seminars and meetings, that it's really hard to make yourself come in for a one-hour seminar if you're at home, but if you're automatically, you're going to be in the office, you know, you just walk down a couple doors, you're more likely to do so. It sets them up for more of those experiences in graduate school. One of the things that I wanted to bring up in terms of relating to communicating expectations to your graduate students is actually something that I started last year when everybody was forced to go home during lockdown. And my students had a lot of structure in their program and everything already. So I actually feel like we made the transition to COVID times very smoothly. The students were amazing. They didn't really miss a beat. But one of the things that I implemented was a weekly update email. And that was just a way to make sure that we maintained a good line of communication. We were still doing our, you know, virtual meetings with the group and individually, but every Friday afternoon, and I still do this now because it's my favorite day of the week now, not that Friday wasn't already my favorite day of the week, but every Friday afternoon or evening, each one of my grad students sends me their weekly update and their weekly update oftentimes 
will say something like, I helped Elizabeth weigh cattle this week, and I developed this assay this week and tested it and figured out that this was failing and we had to do something else or anything else that they troubleshot during the week. And then a lot of times they'll have an attachment to that email. So it'll be like, this is the lit review section that I wrote this week, or this is the materials and methods section that I wrote this week. And I can see each week that they know that that Friday update is something where they can kind of put a period on the end of a successful week and say, here you go, Steph. Here's what I've been up to. I'm awesome, which I always think that when I read that, I'm like, this is so great. And then some of them too will say what their goals are for the next week, which I really appreciate because I can be like, oh, we need to add this thing to your list that wasn't on your radar or usually the reverse. Oh, that wasn't on my radar. I'm really glad it's on your radar. (laughs) Yeah, that's actually a lot of what I do in my individual meetings because we meet each week. So it kind of does keep that accountability to that kind of week basis. But I really like that. Uh, Thinking about expectations and setting up expectations. Early on in their program, you know, we talk about the students not really knowing what they need to do. And one of the things that's like the first line that I talk about in terms of expectations for them is to be engaged in self-learning. And one of the things that becomes really difficult for them is to understand that self-learning is so many different facets. Of course, reading papers and, say, synthesizing the information that they learn, but it's also going to... Uh, seminars and talking to their fellow students and learning about what they're doing in terms of their program and what they're learning and the assays that they're doing and and really just trying to soak it all in. Don't be afraid to step out and learn about things that maybe aren't related to what you think you're going to do as well as what you're doing right now in your program. I think one of the biggest reasons that expectations are important is that it hopefully prevents a lot of frustration down the road. If you aren't really doing a good job of expressing your expectations to your graduate student, you're sort of lackluster about it or you let them get away with some things and you know it's okay that you missed that deadline. I wasn't too per- perturbed by it. And then you get to the end of their program and all of a sudden you're like this totally different person from who's been working with them. <laughs> and that student doesn't really understand It was fine six months ago. How come it's not okay now? So you really need to set that expectation from from really the outset to be able to to avoid some of those frustrations down the road. We talked last time about this idea that having those regular meetings really helped us having that situation where the student gets towards the end and we have so much that they have to get done that, again, everybody gets frustrated. And so setting expectations up front and then, again, reinforcing those throughout it's amazing how different the future interactions become because they have the good habits. They, they understand what's expected. And I think they're happier because it's clear to them, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And they're not wondering all the time, oh, what, what should I be doing? Am I doing enough? Am I doing this correctly? Should I be doing something else? One of the things that I think is really important related to this topic is actually putting in a lot of initial interaction and effort with the student very early on in their program. And so it's going to seem almost like like a, a disproportionate amount of time that you might spend with that new student, but that will reap benefits later if you can really spend that time with them initially and say, here's my expectations, lay out that clear expectation like you were talking about that they are reading, you know, ask them, what have you read lately? That's actually a standing open and go round question for my graduate meetings is tell us something interesting you've read lately that, you know, lays out the clear expectations that you better be reading something and you're going to get asked questions about it. So it's not just I read the abstract before the meeting and was ready to BS about something. Right. And so I think the students really broaden themselves from that. So I think putting in that initial effort with a student up front is very much worth it, because one of the things you can do is drive or propel forward that curiosity for their topic. And I think once a student, especially if we're hiring the right students, once that student gets that spark of curiosity lit, they will shift from you needing to tell them, this is what you need to do, and this is how you do it, and this is when it's due, to being much more self-driven and independently minded. And they really take, like you said, more ownership of their program and drive that forward. You know, you talked about this idea of spending a little bit more time up front. And that actually probably starts with before the student gets here and kind of game plan how you're going to approach, you know, those first few weeks. 
So I know recently you spent more time really thinking through what you're going to have individual students work on when they first get here and set up some expectations that they can meet very quickly and start developing those habits very quickly. You want to talk about some of what you've done and what you learned? As a teacher, I often joke that the only day of class that I really truly prepare for, especially after teaching a class for 10 years, like I know the material pretty well, is the first day of class. But I always update my game plan for the first day of class every semester. And I lay out exactly what I want to get across during that class, what I want to do for building community of learners in that class, and whatever other my goals are. And I realized I should have been doing that with my graduate students. So for my last few graduate students, especially since they've started in pandemic times, is I've really focused on laying out very clear expectations, giving them assignments, saying this is due the first week, this is due the second week. I wanted to make sure that they felt like their time wasn't just going to be wandering around their apartment, wondering what they're supposed to be doing right now. Instead, it was, here's a research topic, here's some papers to get you started, and then checking in with them frequently. My last two were very different. So one was a brand new master's student and she had some undergraduate research experience, but you know, obviously it was new to grad school. I actually asked her if she, her project wasn't going to be starting for several months. And I asked her if she was interested in writing up a paper for some survey data that we had. And she actually just presented that last week at the Midwest meetings and did a, a, a phenomenal job with it. And she's writing that paper up, but that gave her a task to work on every day. So she had to figure out statistics and things like that before she even had taken her first stats class. So she was doing a lot of asking questions of the other students. She actually had to go find some resources on campus. Um, plus, she's going to get a publication out of it. And I got the data published. So it's it's definitely a win-win. For my other one, who was a, a new PhD student, so came very experienced with a lot of practical animal experience and some lab experience, my first task to him, besides his reading and lit review, was go work on this assay. We've never done this assay in the lab. We should totally be able to do it, but we needed practice on fresh versus frozen samples and a couple other details. Basically, over the course of the first month, he developed that assay, coordinated getting samples from harvest so that he could do testing on them, and uh, figured out what works and what doesn't. He's continuing to troubleshoot that so that when his project starts this summer, He'll be ready to hit the ground running and we won't have to worry about that particular aspect of the project. Other thing that I did was actually started to create peer mentorships. And I think we should talk about that in a future episode. But essentially, I took a very senior student and talked with them first and asked if they would be willing to be a peer mentor to one of these new students. That was really great from a community building standpoint. So they actually went for walks together and they went out and you know had conversations. They made sure that they knew when they were going to be doing things in the lab. So they would send an email out and be like, anybody who needs to learn this technique, make sure you're here Wednesday morning. And that would make sure that everybody got trained. They've had really good communication about like, this is how we order supplies and just kind of the day-to-day -day stuff that a student might miss if they're, you know, basically being forced to start their first year of their program from their apartment instead of from their grad student office. Yeah. So that really gives them some ownership. I really think having those those immediate tasks that they can dive into right away has been really, really helpful. The other thing that I think is really important when you're setting expectations is, again, it's it's your expectations of them, but also what they should expect of you. Totally. And And one of the things that I like to make clear in writing is that we're both invested in their success and that they should not be afraid to come and talk to me about things. So we set up these weekly meetings, but I love it when they give me a call or they drop in because they're working on something and they had a thought or a question. And if I get an answer now, I can move forward. Or if I get a little bit of direction, I won't waste time. I just make it very clear, especially since I travel so much, it is not an inconvenience. It is not an interruption. Go ahead and, and contact me because I really am invested in their success. And it is a relationship. You know, it's a mentor-mentee relationship. It's really a partnership. It really is about us working together to develop new knowledge. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's absolutely a partnership. And that's how we need to look at it, which again, is another thing that as faculty, we were never really trained in this idea of people management. And yet that's exactly what we do when we find ourselves as mentors. So I think the last piece of advice I would give out is that Expectations only work if there are accountability factors in place. And if those expectations are not met, you need to do some thinking ahead of time about what kind of consequences you can dish out. 
if they don't meet them. And I would encourage you that if expectations are not met, a mentor of mine always says, seek first to understand. So seek first to understand that maybe there was just something personal going on in that student's life. Maybe something, you know, they had a big stats exam that week or something, or maybe they just didn't get that deadline met and they need to have a little um, kick in the pants to get the motivation going for the next time. Most of the time, if you just point out, you know, this was what we had decided together that you were going to get accomplished and you didn't get it accomplished, they're the ones who are the hardest on themselves. And so I don't feel like I have to do anything beyond just being that accountability partner. I agree with you that that's important. The last thing that I really wanted to mention is for my students, I am their mentor and advisor. But I'm also their boss because they're an employee. They're expected to work 20 hours a week outside of their research and outside of their classwork. And they work as a part of a big group of students that help get our ruminant nutrition research done. And that's multiple faculty that work together. And so sometimes there are things that are in conflict. And I think it's really important to, again, set expectations and help them understand this is expected for them to do this work. But it's also important for them to communicate when there are things that are happening that may cause them not to be able to meet some expectation that we have in terms of their program. And and so I don't always know. And so I want them to be able to tell me that. So again, seek first to understand. Yeah, and expectations might change each semester depending as appointments change or if they move on to a teaching assistantship from something else. So that's good to keep that line of communication open. Okay, so I think we're about out of time for today. So thank you for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. Our show is on YouTube and the link will be in the show notes. Use the comments section to tell us your thoughts on the question of the week so we and others can learn from you. As a reminder, the question this week was, how do you communicate expectations to your graduate students? Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.